Great. And then um, would we be able to, yep, everybody's getting muted right now. Got a couple of people calling in. Okay, thank you, Derek. Thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, today is uh, Monday, February 7th. This is the town council meeting for Weathersfield. And if I can have um, Councilman Biggs, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to, to the, the flag, flag of the United States, States of America, America and, to the, and to the Republic, Republic which, which it stands, one nation, one nation, one nation under God, under God, under God indivisible, indivisible, liberty, and justice, justice for all. For all. Thank you. One day they will figure out a Zoom app to keep everybody from talking over top of each other so it comes out as clear as possible. But until then, we will do this and hopefully be back in person uh, soon enough. And with that, I see the two thumbs up from our um, director of uh, our public health director from the Central Connecticut Health District. Um, as well, I see Diane Duke, uh, Weathersfield's representative on that as well. And I don't believe anybody else, yep. but- uh, Nope, Debbie Hinault. Oh, Debbie, you're down there. Sorry, I saw you waving. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Um, again, another modern age difficulty with Zoom, trying to find everybody as you scan across. Um, Thank you uh, all for your service. Um, not only uh, on behalf of the town, but uh, I know, Charles, you have been very active uh, with the health district um, executive directors and directors uh, throughout the state. You know, we are going on to uh, the, we're in the third year of this, but uh, our second year uh, coming up. Uh, I guess the date officially is for everybody. I call it Friday the 13th. Uh, March 13th, when things really um, took a turn. Um, we, we've seen the peaks and valleys and, you know, the, the good and the bad of this. And we're hopeful as everybody uh, continues to look down the path of where we're going, that we're, we're starting to see the, the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, vaccinations, boosters, social distancing, mask wearing, all the precautions that we have taken um, have gotten us to this point. So um, thank you very much for being on. Um, with that, is Sue still on? I, yep, I saw her in the corner. Um, we will need to do the attendance for council members that are here present with us tonight. Okay, Councillor Biggs? Present. Councillor Forrest? Here. Councillor Hill? Here. Councillor Lesser? Here. Councillor O'Connor. Councillor Pelletier. Here. Councillor Pentelo. Here. Deputy Mayor Mazzarella. Here. And Mayor Rell. Here. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Yeah, I got a little too ahead of myself thanking the health district for all that they've done uh, in this time, but um, it does go without saying. It has been a challenge for um, Weathersfield, for the state, and for uh, the world as, as a whole, um, given the circumstances of the pandemic, but uh, we are getting our way through this. And uh, um, thankfully that uh, um, we've seen a decrease in the, the high, highest levels uh, that we'd seen throughout the, the two years. And that is due to the Omicron variant and the contagiousness of this. And maybe some of the, the laxing of rules and um, sector rules and requirements, but um, um, with the help of not only those on this call, but uh, the help of uh, majority of people in the state of Connecticut, we did start to see that number decrease over the last two weeks. So um, without further ado, I will turn it over to um, our health district director, Charles ba Brown, to uh, not only talk about where we are with the um, pandemic, but also um, your um, fiscal statement and um, how things are looking uh, for you at the health district. Yep. So tonight, hopefully COVID will be a small part about what we talk about. Uh, it has been a huge part of what we've dealt with 
as the mayor said, over the past two years, uh, and will still continue to be something that we deal with every single day. Um, I do want to say thank you to Diane and Debbie uh, from the, our board uh, being able to make it tonight to support us. They support you uh, in Weathersfield by serving on our board of health. There's an additional board member, Anne Marie Di Loretto, who unfortunately could not make it tonight, uh, but all three of them uh, are there to serve uh, Weather Weathersfield residents' best interest in the board of health and provide us with their expertise and oversight uh, as well in the things that we do. And we, you know, really couldn't do this without them and their being involved. So I want to thank each one of them for their service to our agency. Uh, with that, I'm going to kind of share my screen now uh, to start jumping into a little bit of a presentation. So here before COVID, we actually did this every year. We would come and, and, and talk to each one of our towns uh, to describe, you know, kind of what we did uh, how we did those things and give uh, each of our town councils an opportunity to ask questions, uh, to delve into a particular topic if they were uh, interested in it, uh, so that people would have a good understanding of what a health department or health district did. Um, health departments in the, in the state of Connecticut are a little bit different. And before the pandemic, a lot of times, you know, people's interactions with health departments uh, would be fairly minimal. Um, they might know that, you know, they did restaurant inspections. They might know that, oh, if they had to put a deck on their house, that they needed the health department to come look at a septic system. Uh, but the scope of everything that we did uh, was still pretty much a mystery. And that's a large part because um, public health, we work in prevention. Uh, so when we do our job right, nothing happens. So people don't get sick. You know, the restaurants, you know, work and function and all the systems are, are moving along the way that they're supposed to. Um, it's only when huge things go wrong, like pandemics, that people really start to hear about public health as a whole. Um, so let's go through, you know, kind of looking at uh, Central Connecticut Health District. Uh, so uh, my, once again, my name is Charles Brown. I'm the director of health for the Central Connecticut Health District. Uh, Patricia Checo, our chairman for the Board of Health. Uh, could not be with us tonight, but she sends her regards. Uh, and we're going to talk about the three big P's uh, tonight, the prevent, promote, and protect of public health. So some general information about CCHD. We are the local health department for the towns of Berlin, Newington, Rocky Hill, and Weathersfield. And we serve a combined population that bounces around between 97 and 98,000. Um, we were founded in 1996. So we just went over our 25th year uh, and we had a new emblem uh, to actually celebrate that. And we provide a broad range of public health services to our member towns. Um, CCHD is one of 20 regional public health departments in the state of Connecticut. Uh, in Connecticut, we're a little unique in the fact that we have three different types of health departments uh, that a town could be a part of. Uh, you could either be part of a district like us uh, where you have two or more towns to get together to work, uh, you know, to work together to provide public health services and fund those. Uh, you can be a, a full-time department where you might be a town or a municipality that just has their own health department or a part-time department. And a part-time department generally uh, has, you know, a full-time sanitarian. They have, a, you know, a part-time doctor or director of health that oversees uh, orders and things of that nature. Usually they're very small towns uh, that don't have a lot of services that they provide. So here about three years ago, right before the pandemic hit, we actually moved to new offices in Rocky Hill. Uh, we're at 2080 Silestine Highway, uh, Suite 100. Uh, many of you know, if you look on the left-hand side as you're heading down the Silestine South uh, towards Rocky Hill, uh, you'll see the St. Francis building with that uh, curved uh, brick facade on the front. Uh, that is our, our offices has been for three years now. Uh, we have 14 full-time employees, including three COVID-19 uh, grant funded positions that we've added over the last two years. Uh, also have over 50 active professional lay volunteers. And we have an oversight from a uh, 14 member board uh, of health uh, that, you know, that have board members appointed by their member towns 
And this is based on population. Uh, so as you see, Berlin has three more uh, board members, Newington with four, Rocky Hill with three, and Weathersfield with three. Uh, jumping in a little bit to the bottom line, the amount of numbers, health departments are funded in a variety of ways. One of the big ways is um, by the town's contributions to be able to provide for our support. Uh, in last year, on 2021, uh, the contributions for the town for from the towns uh, came to us at six dollars and sixty per capita, so that's per person uh, for every person within um, within our district. Uh, that totaled up to six hundred twenty four thousand one hundred seventy three dollars. Now we get six dollars and sixty cents from the town. Uh, we also get a dollar eighty five from the state per capita, uh, and that's that's per year. So per person per year, we get that much. Um, so town contributions, you know, are a big part of what we um, get to support our agency. Uh, we also get a variety of grants um, that totaled up about 678,000. Uh, and then there's program revenue. Uh, programs that we run include uh, licensing restaurants, uh, being able to charge fees for septic inspections, uh, flu clinics, vaccinations for COVID, uh, those types of programs and fees licensure uh, actually brought in about $313,945 last year. A uh, little bit of interest income, not a lot, um, but you know, all told, you know, not a bad, not a bad line. Our expenditures, we don't, we're not the type of agency that makes widgets. Uh, so really our expenditures goes the majority of that uh, to supporting our professional staff. Uh, so salaries and benefits are a huge part of what we, what we pay out. Uh, some professional and contracts and then our operating expenses to keep the lights on in the office and everything, everybody functioning uh, makes up the rest of our expenditures. But the majority of money that we spend is on the professional staff that does the work. Um, they are our bread and butter and we can't do that without them. So let's talk very quickly about the difference between healthcare and public health. Um, you know, our primary focus of healthcare is really the individual, where public health looks as, you know, our primary focus is the population as a whole. Um, when healthcare goes to make an intervention, uh, they do a diagnosis, they talk about treatment. Uh, for public health, our interventions really are assessing what's going on within the communities looking at uh, developing policies and assuring that things are working the way that they're supposed to within that realm. Um, the process for healthcare really talks about the management of patient care. For public health, we really talk more about systems management. Uh, what's happening in the environment? What needs to change with human behavior uh, to be able to affect the best change? Um, the outcome in healthcare really looks to return the individual to health where in public health, we're looking and striving always to have a healthy community and to really make sure that the conditions are there to stay healthy. So what's the purpose of a public health agency? Um, it really would be nice, especially in times like of a pandemic, when somebody could walk into a pharmacy and say, yeah, you know, I'd like to have an ounce of prevention rather than have the 15,000 pounds of cure that we've been trying to get right now. So public health really strives to prevent epidemics and spread of disease, to protect against environmental hazards, preventing injuries, promoting and encouraged healthy behaviors, responding to disasters and assist our communities in the recovery from those and to ensure the quality and accessibility of health services. We're gonna talk a little bit about the things that we do to help to support these topics. Um, can't get away without talking about COVID. Uh, uh, for Weathersfield, as of the 1st of February, uh, we had a total number of cases, uh, about 4,929 as of the 1st of February. The total number of deaths in Weathersfield totaled at 48. And the number of tests, and this is only the tests that actually get reported to the state, was 96,603. So there's probably many more of those tests that happen at home and all that. Um, vaccinations within Weathersfield. Um, our seniors are really doing the best out of all the age groups here. Uh, we've had in Weathersfield about 94.24% of seniors fully vaccinated 
and 70.5% have been boosted as well. Um, you know, you go down in the spectrum and those who are 45 to 64 at about 85 and a half percent with 48% boosted, the 25 to 44 year olds at about 90.2% with 39% boosted, 18 to 24 year olds uh, looking at about 90 91%, uh, 91 91.5% almost, and 37% uh, of those boosted. Um, 12 to 17 year olds at about 40, at about 75%, 74.5, and 22% of those have been boosted. And then the 5 to 11s, 37.6% uh, of those who have been fully vaccinated. And at this point, uh, the booster is not available for them at this point. Um, that's just being approved. So Weather Seal is doing pretty good uh, with respect to vaccinations. As the mayor said, uh, we wanna make sure that people are doing the right things, um, You know, making sure that they're getting the vaccinations when they're appropriate, making sure that they're up to date, uh, doing the right things as far as wearing a mask when it's appropriate, washing your hands and you know, watching your distance as we go through. These three W's and the vaccinations really has, has kept us where we have been at that 48 mortality. Uh, for a very long time. It's kept it fairly low. So CCHD response activities, we've really been working hard over the last two years, uh, really focusing on vaccination of vulnerable populations and meeting their needs, uh, especially the adults with functional needs and working with the homebound uh, to assure that they get their appropriate uh, care and vaccinations. Daily, we report to each town the number of cases uh, so that their first responders are aware of the situations that they're going into. Uh, we conduct contact tracing with a great group of volunteer contact tracers uh, working with our staff uh, to really be able to follow up uh, to, in times of, uh, you know, of when the numbers are, are not too high uh, to try to figure out how to get people into quarantine and isolation appropriately so that they, we can slow the spread of the disease down. Uh, when the times are really high, a lot of what we're doing is health education, really out there trying to educate people on what they need to do uh, to prevent this uh, from happening and to prevent the spread when they actually do get it. We provided a ton of technical support for our schools. Uh, Superintendent Emmett and I have been close from the beginning of this as we've, as we've tried to uh, weather every single storm that's come down. Uh, we walked each and every school prior to them uh, actually opening back up, uh, and they're, we're here for them anytime that they have an issue. Uh, we're the subject matter experts for the press, for any of the regulated facilities, and for residents. Our phone numbers are out there. Uh, our website is there for if anybody needs information uh, that they can call us, and we're happy to help walk them through any particular situation. Uh, we do provide regional support of local health departments uh, to our neighbors and other health departments that are around the areas. And we've supported a lot of distribution for personal protective equipment uh, to medical providers in our towns and to long-term care facilities. So that's a lot to say about COVID. And that's about all I'm going to say about COVID tonight, because a lot of what I want to say are things that we do aside from COVID. And we do these things every year. And regardless of whether or not that we're in a pandemic, we still need to conduct these activities. Uh, first one is dealing with epidemics. We have seasonal epidemics every year of influenza. And even during COVID, we actually did over 1,300 flu shots with the average time per shot under three minutes per shot, uh, utilizing drive-through uh, techniques that we'd never done before uh, to assure that everybody was safe, as they, were, um, as they were getting their vaccinations and to, to assure that our volunteers were safe as well. Uh, outside was the best way to do that. Sometimes the conditions were a little challenging, but our volunteers really stepped up uh, and made sure that that could happen to protect our, uh, our residents from a pandemic, so to speak. Um, every day we also follow up with other diseases that are reportable within Connecticut that go from hepatitis A, B, and C, salmonella, we follow up on lead poisoning in children. Um, we look at vaccine preventable diseases and other issues like Legionella uh, that happened within the water. 
we look at mosquito tick-borne diseases. Um, you know, here before the pandemic, eastern equine encephalitis was a big issue. Uh, if you can remember back that far, it doesn't seem like that's big of an issue right now compared to what we've dealt with. But we do monitor for that disease, and we do um, continue to to follow the trends to see where it's spreading and what we can do uh, to be able to limit these types of mosquito and tick-borne diseases. So, working with the state uh, to assure when they get uh, positive mosquitoes trapped in those that we get the word out so that people can take action mostly in the summertime uh, is one of the things that we do uh, to address things like West Nile virus, Zika, Lyme disease, or Lyxiosis and Debsiosis. Uh, CCHG also responds to the opioid crisis. So we, we were one of the conveners of all of our local response agencies in our towns uh, when we saw this coming up. Uh, we actually started to see a lot of cases of hepatitis C in younger people and intravenous drug use was one of the biggest ways uh, for them to actually be exposed to that. Uh, that brought us in to say, you know, what can we actually do, uh, you know, at the local level to address these types of situations uh, with people getting over to us uh, and, and exposure to the substance abuse. Uh, currently, you know, we have work groups that are addressing prevention, response, and recovery. Uh, our agency kind of oversees these work groups. Uh, we were uh, awarded two years ago uh, a grant from the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services uh, to work with people suffering from addiction and their families. Uh, we have a recovery coach that works um, in all four of our towns. The primary focus had been uh, along the uh, Berlin Turnpike, but as we're seeing uh, using uh, tools like OD Map and looking at the Office of uh, the Medical Examiner, uh, we're seeing a shift uh, actually in the number of overdoses uh, to the Silostine. Um, some of them around town line, some of them around up and down the Silostine area. So our recovery coach actually is out there physically trying to find people, uh, making sure that if they're ready to, um, to start their path to recovery, that we can ask that simple question, how can we help? How can we get you the tools and resources that you need uh, to get this demon off your back. Protecting against environmental hazards, our environmental health staff uh, really does an outstanding job with this. In the last year, and this is just last year's numbers, uh, had 1,242 food, food service inspections, 15 septic inspections, 85 pools, 46 motels, and 125 salon inspections just in the last year. In addition to that, they responded to 235 complaints. Of those 235, 43 uh, were COVID-related uh, complaints, but the majority of complaints that we see are housing and property maintenance issues. Um, that's over and above what we see. So from hoarding uh, to issues of long grass, uh, uh, pools that are, that are stagnant, uh, those are the types of things that we see. Other, other complaint issues are food-related. We do follow up with those when people have issues with maybe something they ate at a restaurant, um, follow up on rodents and insects, garbage and refuse, air, water pollution, and then motels. We have had um, complaints at motels from people who've stayed there that we do follow up. Um, sometimes those are bed bugs, sometimes they're even uh, worse than that. Environmental health issues uh, beyond the inspection services, uh, we have our putting on airs program. Uh, this is uh, where um, in the past, we would actually send out a team of uh, health, uh, health inspector and a certified asthma health educator that would go and do home visits with asthma patients, primarily children, and use that team approach to highlight triggers in, the, in their environment and to go over proper uh, use of medication. Since COVID has kind of put a hamper on people going into others' houses, they've really stepped up. Uh, brought in technology, used the iPhone, been able to actually conduct virtual inspections and virtual visits and check-ins uh, to assist with children to manage their asthma conditions, you know, a lot better. Uh, this has been a great program for years now, and it's continuing even in uh, the challenges brought by the pandemic. In addition to that, we also do uh, radon kit distribution and follow-up with uh, 
lead poisoning. We do a lot of information on lead poisoning prevention and follow up on any uh, lead poisoned child. Promoting healthy uh, and encouraging healthy behaviors. Uh, hopefully a lot of y'all were involved in our walking competition among the four towns. Uh, I actually have good news if you had not heard yet. Uh, two, two things. One, uh, somebody other than Berlin actually won the walking competition. Uh, it had been Berlin for six years. And last year, Newington actually stepped up and won the overall competition for 2021. Weathersfield, you guys are no slackers. Um, you actually won the impact award last year for the highest number of participation. And to me, that's really the, war, the award that I wanna see. I wanna see more people out there being active, walking in their communities. And Weathersfield, I think has been really great to work with. Um, you know, we miss Peter in the planning department uh, working on complete streets projects um, and really just, you know, the, the bike walk Weathersfield folks have been outstanding in getting people up and moving within their committee. So it has been a wonderful uh, group to work with and congratulations on the impact award for the highest participation during our walking competition. Uh, we're gonna be starting that up again here, uh, probably summer, maybe fall, uh, we'll have to see what the best time is, but we expect big things from you guys again. We also respond to disasters as we've seen. Uh, we do planning associated with this. Um, believe it or not, we actually had plans for pandemics uh, before the pandemic happened. Uh, so we're not starting from blank page as we do this. And even in the midst of a pandemic, uh, we continue to look for ways to improve how we respond. Uh, so for each clinic that we do, uh, we use that uh, as a drill for medical countermeasure dispensing. Uh, uh, so we actually conduct an after action report, uh, look for improvement planning opportunities, and really change our plans according to what we learned from each individual scenario. Um, so, you know, once again, we started drive through clinics this time instead of the walkthrough because it was safer to be able to accomplish the vaccinations that way. So we set up a plan for it. And as we ran through each one of those clinics, we did after action hot washes and actually learned and refined that plan over time to where now we have, I think, a very good plan and operation uh, to be able to do drive-through clinics or dispensing of informa uh, information or resources. Uh, it's not just infectious diseases, flooding and other natural disasters are things that are within our ballywick that we plan and work with emergency managers for. So uh, almost done looking at how we prepare for the future. So we're always looking um, at administrative and health policies. Uh, last year, we actually revised our sanitary code for the first time in a few years. Uh, and we're also looking forward to the full adoption of the FDA food code at the state level. Um, that's been something I think that uh, COVID has put off for a little while, uh, but they're, they're starting to pick back up in the pace of, of putting that in place. Uh, we have begun our community health assessment and improvement planning uh, here in the last year. We've actually uh, collected a lot of data and are working to get that together so that we can bring our community leaders like Mayor Rell, uh, town managers like Bonnie, uh, to bring them together to talk about what are the priorities uh, within our four communities that the health district can really work towards in the future. With that, uh, I wanna say my thanks to all of our member towns and to you, our public, for your continued support. Uh, our website is right there. Please visit our website, ton of good information there. And I stand ready to answer any questions that I can. Great, thanks. thanks. Thank you for uh, you know the thorough report on a lot of things that uh, the health district covers, and uh, you are correct. You know, I see the, the slide every year going back to the triple E threat, and Weathersfield is no stranger to mosquitoes and to um, warm weather. Mm -hmm. uh, being low land near the river in the cove, we have had our share of um, triple E threats uh, in this town. Um, mm -hmm. None the like of which is the pandemic. So uh, I guess it does um, bode well that you are prepared to handle any of these um, situations that come up. Uh, any questions for Charles or Debbie or Diane? Uh,
Councilor Lesser. Thank you, Mayor, and my apologies, everybody, for getting kicked off with technical difficulties. Uh, just to comment, Debbie and Diane, thank you for your service. All you do means a lot to all of us. And Charles, I don't know where we'd be without you. Um, great article in the paper, by the way. But uh, many of you know, but perhaps all of you don't know, Charles helped advise us when to reopen the schools and I was on the reopening committee and he did an amazing job providing so much data, information and recommendations. And all that you've done for us, Charles, during this very difficult last couple of years, can't say thank you enough. So just a uh, big thanks uh, from me for, you know, for everybody, for all you've done, but appreciate it. That's it, thank you. thank you. And, and the picture in that, uh, in that article was obviously taken a long time ago because there was actually brown hair in my beard at that point. I wasn't going to mention that, Charles. <laughs> I know. You're too nice, Ken. Okay. Any other questions uh, for Charles? Um, I guess one I have for you that's been um, posed to me a couple times is that we're starting to see the... Um, testing numbers and the positivity rates, um, depending on where they fluctuate. Now mm -hmm. that uh, home tests are readily available, are they in the metrics when it comes to determining? I see you shaking your head. Yep. You know, does, does that worry anybody from the health district perspective that, um, you know, when we're measuring it through, um, those testing facilities that report their data mm -hmm. um, that we may be missing some folks and that you know those that do test at home never report it to anybody. They just simply take the guidance from the CDC or from the uh, health district and quarantine and stay low for five days and then come back. Yeah. Um, um, to be honest, it, it is a little concerning to to us in the health district um, that the numbers are not as accurate as they could be been reporting. Um, you know, at this point in the pandemic, um, we've actually heard from CDC in the state, um, you know, that we're, people know what to do, that the information has really been out there for some time. Um, and really the numbers that we're looking now is less about the positivity rate and it's much more about things like hospitalization because we can really get our hands wrapped around that number. And, you know, the hospitals are really an important part of response here. Uh, if they start to get overwhelmed um, and get up into that thousand and two thousand number, uh, we really, you know, during this Omicron surge, we were really very concerned because some of the hospitals were right on the edge, uh, to be completely honest. So making sure that they have the capacity and we see that number rise up, that's really our, been our bellwether now um, rather than the positivity rate. Positivity rate, even for those um, that do get reported, I think it can be a useful number. It's just not the only number that we're paying attention to. Right. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else with any questions or comments that they want to bring up? on CCHD. Seeing none, thank you. Uh, Charles, Diane, Debbie, thank you so much for your service on behalf of the town of Wethersfield uh, and the whole district. Uh, we do appreciate your service. Uh, fingers crossed that we get to that point where we were last year where we see spring and numbers go down. Um, but this time we have a handle on any variants and we can be prepared as they arise. Yes, sir, that's what we do. Thank you. All right. Thank you, folks. Take care. Have a great night. Be safe. You too. Okay. I see a couple of phone numbers on here. And Derek, the master of the switchboard, can be able to bring them in. Um, I want to remind folks that in this public comment section, uh, there are two public comment sections. The first one and the second one are both limited to five minutes. Um, and um, I don't know if I need to do it or if Bonnie or Derek will do it. I can call on the numbers and uh, we can do it that way. Sure, I can um, do that. Uh, five, six, three, 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 eight, seven. If you wish to speak, please unmute. 
Hi, uh, this is Judy Keene from 126 Broad Street. Um, I was I would like to present tonight to request that the town council reopen discussions about supporting the city of Hartford in their own efforts to consider a plan to reacquire the Brainerd Airport property. The last time that you discussed the proposal, in the end, according to Mr. Dillon of CAA, the plan was that the airport would re-educate their pilots, monitor, and firmly discourage pilots from flying over old Wethersfield neighborhoods. This has not happened yet. Recent articles in the Hartford Current, written by a pilot described as a West Hartford resident, but who apparently resides in Old Wethersfield now, introduces a new grassroots pilot association organized to maintain the airport and, in fact, to expand the airport so that more jets can access it regularly. They have stated that they will push to make Brainerd a larger regional presence, more like Tweed in New Haven and that they have already done so or will hire lawyers and lobbyists. This is all consistent with the 2014 Brainerd Airport Master Plan to expand the airport and allow for larger commercial jets. These 100 pilots should not supersede the quality of life of Wethersfield residents. These pilots pay minimal fees to land at the airport, $15 $15 if they are under 6,000 pounds. And many are evidently transient pilots who have no skin in the game except that they now fear losing their ability to land and take off with minimal cost. A tweed in Wethersfield's backyard would destroy our quality of life, lower our property values, and erase the desirable historic district that has been forged and discourage business growth and overall be a disaster for Wethersfield. The densely populated areas south of the airport today are just a drop in the bucket. If we see larger jets landing and taking off from Brainerd, the entire town will rattle. Please reconsider your plan to allow the airport airport to self-police. It will, a voluntary flight route adherence will never happen. That's the end of my comments. Do you have any questions or suggestions? Thank you, Mrs. Keene. Um, don't think we go back and forth with questions or comments. We can continue to have this conversation going forward. Uh, thank you for your uh, testimony tonight. And uh, like I said, we will take it into consideration. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> all right, the next number is 563-6923. Please unmute. If you wish to comment. Uh, good evening. This is Robert Young from 20 Copper Mill Road. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Bonnie Therian for uh, completing my FOI request of July 28th, 2021. Uh, it took six months an FOI completed in Weathersfield. Uh, six months is, is quite long, and, and nobody should put up with that, and, and it should not happen again. But Bonnie did a fine job uh, following up and, and getting that information to me. Unfortunately, the information I got, a lot of it, or I should say a portion of it, was redacted um, information that's all blocked out so you cannot read it and um, this obviously is something that the, uh, the attorney who was reviewing it or his people that was reviewing it before they released it to me did to it which creates what I call and you know I've made some very negative comments over time about Weathersfield but having when reading these th- this information All I can see is secrecy, hiding, something crooked, uh, dishonesty going on. If it's blacked out, it tells me there's something bad that that they don't want nobody to see. Not something good. And there's a heck of a lot of it in the information that I received. 
And I think that's something that the town of Wethersfield should be um, thinking about. I mean, it really sends a, a heck of a message about these bad things that I've mentioned. And uh, uh, there's no way you're going to convince me differently. If it's wiped out, cleared right out, where nobody can read what it is, it had to be bad information that was in there. Very incriminating, for that, for that matter. Now, I also attended your last meeting on, what was it, January 18th. And uh, I got to tell you, that was a kind of a lengthy meeting. And, uh, you know, you went through uh, having the MDC presentation. You went through having a DOT presentation on, on, on the Putnam Bridge. You went through having a trail. And, and uh, then you went on to uh, a Wilkett Hill Road Project. Then you had a camp, cannibalist, uh, cannibalist uh, discussion that went on and on. You had a discussion on the regular uh, meeting versus the workshop meetings. You had bond council selection going on. You had custodial contract that you were talking about as well. And, you know, and then you finally had public comment which I wasn't around for because I think it happened somewhere around, what, 11 o'clock-ish, 11 p.m., somewhere in that time span. I think, uh, uh, and then what, you probably had another public comment after you had your, I think you had an executive session on top of it. And, you, you know, you took on, this is poorly managed. Do we need to have all these people all, all, all in one meeting? and go on for all this time. Uh, as a member of the public, as a taxpayer, I, ex I expect to be up in the front to talk. And then I can hang around and talk later on. But what you did was totally, totally fixed it so the public could not talk. Because, you know, who's going to hang around till 11 o'clock? I understand you folks probably were kind of blurry-eyed at the end of the night as well. But the fact remains, you're the ones who set the pace, and the pace was awful. Now, you had your presentation with the MDC. You know, that gang of, of, of characters have, have nothing but up, up, up in our prices of, of water. I mean, I now use much less water in my property, and my bill is so much higher. And, and, and it continues. It's like every month, it's like what it used to be for three months, and I'm using less water. Uh, these, these people are gangsters, as far as I'm concerned. Then you had the issue of DOT Putnam Bridge Walkway. Well, you know, Mayor, I listened and I listened, and you know, the idea is that the trails connected to the bridge were all state property. And, and now you agreed, you as a council agreed, to maintain those, those walkways and plow out the parking lot and whatever else, because I think you used the word, we can absorb the cost. Is this how we run our business of the town of Wethersfield? We can absorb our costs? We should be analyzing, can we afford to do it? And first of all, we shouldn't have even volunteered to do it because it wasn't the town of Wethersfield's property. It's the, it's the state of Connecticut's property. This is their project, not our project. And they're the ones who should be paying for the maintenance. Whatever the maintenance means, they're the ones that should be taking care of it. Uh, I think it's an extremely amount, a high amount of money putting in that walkway. And then now all the money it's going to take to bridge it from, the high, from whatever roads there are up to the bridge. More money spent for what? And, and, and then, of course, you agree with your, with your team that, oh, it's, we can absorb the cost. Well, I, I'm going to talk about some other issues some other night when I'm in front of you, not on the telephone, about absorbing costs. And uh, I'll talk about them at some point when we're back in the, in the council chambers. Also, you had your discussion on the Wilkett Hill Road project. I cannot believe how long this, has, this project has dragged on. 
I mean, I remember prior to COVID where, uh, what's his name, Mr. Greger, had given a presentation of that. And I thought it was already done. And here, it's still awful. You ride up that road. I rode up that road a couple of times, and, and uh, the road was in terrible condition, and it's continuing to be that way. Uh, that's a great, great way of showing people what we think and how we take care of our property. Then, of course, you had the cannibalist discussion. I mean, you had the police chief. You had a young lady named Erica who was talking and so gave very good supporting uh, comments about not having a cannibalist store in our town. Yeah. Mr. I, I, I don't know where, I don't know where the, I think you voted against it anyway, but the fact remains, um, we don't need that kind of thing. And I understand my time is up, so I'll, yep. hang, I'll, hang, just, I'll hang loose. Your, just for your own edification, uh, I gave you liberty of two and a half more minutes for this uh, time period, and I'll do the same at the second one. Therefore, uh, to um, make you whole, if you will, for the five minutes you did not get at the last meeting. Uh, and we do apologize for that. That was a long meeting, um, but uh, I will grant uh, the additional five minutes for you uh, between the two public hearing or public comment sections. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, the next number, and I think it's the last one, is 878-4688. If you care to speak, please unmute. Again, 878-4688. Yeah, I don't have anything right now. I'm just listening. Okay. Thank you. That's all we have, Mayor, I believe. For the first public comment section? Okay. Mayor, uh, excuse me. Yes. Did you, did you yep. ask? Yep, I'm sorry. Yes. That's I think okay. we did have some um, public comments that came in through email. Yes, I have one here. Um, this is from Cindy Greenblatt, 35 Broad Street. Um, says, I'm sure you've all seen the front page current article about the grassroots organization of plane owners who are hiring attorneys to prevent the closure of Brainerd Airport. The head of the organization, a plane owner from West Hartford, is finally stating in public what we all knew. The goal of the CAA is and has always been to cut the trees and expand the runway to bring commercial jets to Brainerd. The group and the CAA see value in that plan. They see no value in our historic community, nor the damage they will inflict upon our homes, businesses, schools, or resources. They see no value in the floodplain, forest, the Connecticut River, and the wildlife that resides there. They see no value in giving Hartford and the surrounding towns the opportunity to accept, access the Connecticut River to create a vibrant waterfront community. There are only two possible scenarios here, the expansion of the airport and its permanent effects on our historic town or decommissioning the airport. It's time to vote to support Hartford in its efforts to decommission Brainerd Airport. I hope that each of you will reach out to me and your constituents with your plan of action in the face of this very real threat. Thank you, Sue. Um, I may have missed it. Did you say who it was from in the beginning? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Okay. It's Cindy Greenblatt, 35 Broad Street. Okay, thank you. And moving on to the agenda, let me just bring it up real quick. I believe we did have some appointments on the agenda. Let's see, no, no, nope, not yet to so that. We are, oh, okay, we had the public he, uh, hearing. Any comments on the public hearing that is before us? Uh, this is the hearing that uh, was introduced at the last meeting on public order and pedestrian and vehicular traffic safety from aggressive uh, or unlawful solicitation of alms. Anybody from the public on that? 
for the public hearing portion. You want me to go through phone numbers again? Um, sure. 563-3387, anything on the public hearing? No, no, okay. I only wanted to speak about the airport. Thank you. Thanks, Judy. Uh, five, six, three, six, nine, two, three. Anything on the public hearing? Uh, no, Bonnie. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Young. And eight, seven, eight, four, six, eight, eight. Anything on the public hearing? I guess not, Mayor. Okay. Moving on to item three in comments. Uh, this is any comments uh, from boards and commissions, any reports from boards and commissions? Councilman Hill. Uh, thanks, Mayor. Uh, two updates um, tonight. Uh, first, actually regarding Brainerd. February 3rd, I attended the Brainerd Noise Committee meeting. Um, this quarter, there was 172 noise complaints uh, from the airport from Weathersfield residents. Um, one thing I, of note is there was one anonymous threatened, uh, threatening message that did go over to Brainerd. Um, when this does occur, uh, it has to be reported to the, both the state police and the FBI. So I wanted to be obviously certain that all residents do not do that. Um, and I think that really um, there's some frustration that obviously, is, as we know, is, is continues to mount uh, specifically within Old Weathersfield um, regarding specifically, I think, is uh, Mr. Mr. Dillon from the airport authority. Uh, he did. Uh, send a letter to you, Mayor, and the Town Council uh, regarding his involvement. But unfortunately, after speaking with Brainerd, this has not led to any changes at the airport. Um, he did meet with uh, some of the flight schools and just repeated the past voluntary protocols that pilots need to take. And on January 25th, I attended the library uh, board meeting. Uh, there was a discussion on the potential ARPA funds uh, that are coming, flowing through the town that the library could uh, see, uh, they have invited the town council, uh, invited out to tour the library to see any of those, uh, to tour the facility and see any possible ARPA projects they have in mind. And they are collaborating with the high school and historical society on programming for the play Our Town. And beyond that, it is all budget all the time over at the library. Thank you, Councilman. And I actually have a meeting scheduled with uh, Library Director Barry uh, in about a week or two to go over some of her plans for the library and um, start the discussion. She's been very frank with uh, the council in the past on uh, some of the needs of the library. So thank you for that report. Any other reports from boards or commission? Councilman Biggs. Thank you, Mayor. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, so this past week, I did attend the Weathersfield Historical Society meeting. Um, they wanted me to bring back to council as we move into budget season um, and kind of look at the ARPA funds that they will be um, seeking our support um, with um, some projects they have going on. The main one that they're concerned about is the Old Academy. For those of you that live right there um, in Old Weathersfield, you know, the Old Academy, um, has had some issues going on for quite a while. Um, the biggest concern is that the roof has been um, a, a major uh, concern with leaks and whatnot um, and the stability. So they had to remove the bell from up top because of safety concerns. Um, so that is something they wanted to make sure that we definitely put that in the forefront um, so we can all be aware as they come to us and, and seek our support. Uh, there is not a de definitive um, aspect of what they're going to be requesting as far as support, but they wanted to put that on our radar. Um, so I just wanted to share that with you all. Um, as far as the Veterans Commission, um, the team is doing all they can to increase their presence in the community and support the veterans. Um, recently, there was a collab with uh, Representative Turco 
um, in a regional aspect of veterans um, and um, our veterans commission here in town. Um, they were very supportive of that, of really reaching out. Uh, Chief actually was on our last call. Uh, he actually brought a couple of uh, PD um, with him as well, who also served in our veterans. Um, so the most, um, you know, most upcoming thing is we will start planning our Memorial Day parade to see what's going on with that. And Mayor, I believe you sit on that with us. So um, just be on the lookout for that and whatever announcements we decide to make. I think our meeting is upcoming this week. So um, more information will be coming on that. And that's all I have, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Yes, I actually just looked at the council, uh, the calendar uh, Wednesday night, we're gonna be meeting and uh, hopefully um, if all goes well, this will be the first year we're going to have the Memorial Day Parade uh, back um, in person in uh, Old Weathersfield. Uh, a two year hiatus is uh, too long for something like that. So I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to the planning of it. And it's good to see the chief as well as a veteran um, being involved in both the Veterans uh, Committee and the um, Memorial Day Parade. Uh, don't think that for any reason, because of your status, you get to lead the parade. Uh, I think it's always a back and forth between the police and the firefighters. So I don't know who it is this year, but uh, um, I'll let you it's guys. Always the, it's always the honor guard leaves first, and usually it's the Navy leading off. So <laughs> <laughs> we won't get into this between another the Marines. Bait comment, another bait comment Wait, from no. the I'd like to see this. <laughs> We'll let you guys duke it out maybe on the softball field beforehand or something like that. So good. Thank you for that hey, report. Uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Yeah, I just want to uh, comment on um, Councillor Biggs's uh, discussion about the uh, old academy building. Uh, the CIAC has been meeting, uh, discussing all the capital projects and the uh, academy roof chimney and the, uh, the bell tower are all on the list of uh, projects and they have uh, what's called it ballpark estimates of, of funding that they would need to accomplish that but uh, it's definitely on the radar. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Thank you. Anybody else with comments or reports from um, boards or commissions? Uh, I'll take the uh, liberty. I was at the Housing uh, Authority meeting uh, January 24th. Uh, they discussed the budget for uh, the upcoming year. Uh, one thing they do have is a public comment section on uh, rent increases. And uh, there was discussion and um, a vote was taken um, for the seniors. And I think the seniors are at three facilities um, that have my notes, 31 Butler, 55 and 60 Lancaster. Um, for the seniors, uh, instead of a $10 increase in rent, uh, it will be a $5 increase. Um, the rents of the other uh, authority buildings, uh, they're looking at uh, a $10 increase. And then there is a cap um, uh, that they're going to keep in place uh, not to affect um, other rent increases. Uh, this is uh, in part due to uh, service that uh, they provide um, inflation on a number of things. Uh, they have kept uh, the rate, uh, the rent stable over the last year. They did not increase it last year. Uh, they did believe that a minimal $10, per, uh, $10 increase this year um, is sufficient, um, but they did want to make sure that those on fixed incomes, uh, especially our senior population, aren't hit as bad, so they kept it at $5 for them. Uh, that is it, not seeing any other reports from boards or commissions, uh, moving on. Uh, now we can go to um, workshop items for referral. Uh, don't believe there are any of those on the agenda either tonight. So now for, I believe a handful of appointments, um, I believe Councilman Forrest may have those ready. Actually, let me just double check it. <clears throat> yep, here we go. The 
52B. Move Cynthia Clancy, 56 Broad Street, for a term of 2722 to 63024 to the Personal Appeals Board. As Constable Blaze Riccio, 24 Pheasant Run, 2722 to 63022. Zoning Board of Appeals from alternate to full member, Rita Ann Owen, 42 Wells Farms Road, from 91619 to 63022. And those are the three that I have, unless I've missed one, gentlemen and ladies. I'll second. Great. Motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Ayes have it. Motion carries. Moving on to item B3. Uh, Juneteenth day. And I want to thank um, Councilman Lesser for bringing this to the attention of uh, our town manager. Uh, this was a federal designation, I believe last year that changed uh, our calendar for federal federally recognized holidays for June 19th. And because this year, June 19th falls on a Sunday the uh, holiday will be observed on Monday, June 20th. And when we voted on and approved our 2022 meeting dates, um, we inadvertently had our meeting scheduled for Monday, June 20th. So um, in observance of Juneteenth day, we would move that meeting from a regular uh, council meeting to a special meeting on Tuesday, June 21st. Any comments, questions on that? Seems reasonable, Mayor. Okay. Councilman Lesser. Yes, I'm gonna make a motion to uh, move the June 20th, 22 meeting from Monday, June 20th to Tuesday, June 21st in observance of Juneteenth Day. Second. second. Motion has been made and seconded. All I think those. Me to that, by the way, for the record. Okay. Bonnie, we'll give uh, Councilman Lesser the motion, second by Councilman Biggs. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Opposed, nay. Ayes have it. And sorry, I went to Bonnie, not you, Sue. So I saw you take notes on it. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on to item number B4. Um, this is the public hearing that we did not hear anybody talk about, but um, was on our agenda last year or last month to move on to this agenda. Um, is there anybody like to make any comments on this or discussion? Councilman Lesser. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. So I've had residents uh, contact me kind of on both sides of the issue. Some saying that, that we need to do more and do something to handle the aggressive uh, solicitors. Uh, but I had a question today and I don't know if this is best for attorney Slater, but someone uh, concerned about the free speech of uh, the solicitors. So a question about, about that. And then my own question separate from the resident is, um, and maybe attorney Slater can comment on this too. Are we seeing a lot of other towns in Connecticut uh, looking to strengthen or to have new ordinance re regarding aggressive solicitors? Uh, that's it, thank you. Would you like me to jump in, Mayor? Sure, Attorney Slater. The, the question that your constituent asked about whether or not there's First Amendment implications, uh, there are. Uh, the, the United States Supreme Court and other has recognized that communicating to, to ask for um, whether the it's signed, whether it be verbally, even literally holding out a container, that that is communication, and that is something that that has some First Amendment protections. Um, whether or not an ordinance like this would pass muster uh, has not been decided by a Connecticut court or the federal court um, that 
that Connecticut's a part of, although the courts that have looked at these kinds of ordinances tend to, um, they, they are subject to what's called strict scrutiny, um, which is they want to make sure uh, that there is not a better way or a least, less intrusive way to impact the speech. And the, one of the recent notable cases was a case out of Oklahoma, uh, but there's also one in New Mexico, both in the 10th Circuit. So the 10th Circuit has, has ruled on these kinds of ordinances. And, and in both of those instances, the conduct was not tied to alms giving per se, it was the activity of standing in certain kinds of medians uh, and that persons, whether it be uh, whether it be for political purposes or whether it be for seeking alms, basically any kind of communication that you'd have in a, in a median um, in, in certain defined areas in the two ordinances. The courts in, in both of those cases found that the, that the city, one was Oklahoma City in one case and Albuquerque in another, that there wasn't a good record of instances in which they, they there was um, danger to, to, for example, part E as the section about soliciting people in automobiles. That's the one that I think the courts have looked at most often uh, is people who are, and, you know, the ends of medians that are soliciting alms or otherwise acting, um, you know, communicating with people. And those two courts just ruled that the ordinances in their case were in fact not constitutional, that there was uh, not enough of evidence in, in the record in those cases that there were actual public health and safety issues or there wasn't a better way uh, to manage the problem. Uh, frankly, that in those cases, there weren't a lot of instances of any, any accidents or anything of the sort. Uh, it was more of a, you know, sort of a nuisance to people that, to have people asking for, for, um, for arms. In Massachusetts, the, Supreme, the Massachusetts Supreme Court, not the federal court, uh, looked at uh, the issue in Fall River uh, in 2020. So we're seeing more of these cases have been coming out. And in that one, that ordinance was closer to the one that's before you in that it, it singled out the, the solicitation of alms. And the court there said that that was not content neutral uh, because if you were um, you know, working with a charity and or you were working in a political campaign or you just wanted to stand and express free speech uh, with a sign, uh, you wouldn't be covered by the ordinance. Whereas if you were looking to, to uh, collect alms, you would be. So that, that court looked at it under a very strict standard. And based on that strict standard ruled that that ordinance didn't pass muster. Um, and there was another Massachusetts court that, I, that was a district court that looked at some aggressive be, uh, type behavior that you have in your draft ordinance and said in Lowell, Massachusetts, that there might have been other ways in which you could manage that behavior um, through using other other legislation uh, that that exists. For you know, example, in your ordinance, that there's the provision or the draft that uh, once someone said no, you're not supposed to. Uh, person is not supposed to ask again. Uh, in that district court case, they said, well, the person might have more information to share. They might. You know, can you please give me five, you know, five dollars? And if the person says no, the person might say, well, I, I really need it for dinner. I'm not going to use it on drugs. Uh, the, the court found that that second communication is still protected communication. So there are cases that have questioned and, and have overturned uh, these kinds of ordinances. Uh, I'm not aware of a, a case in Connecticut that's done it. The United States Supreme Court hasn't yet ruled on it. Uh, but there is, you know, there is some risk that uh, if challenged, uh, an ordinance like this could be overturned on First Amendment grounds. I will say that, you know, the, no, the case, you know, when, when these cases do go to court, the primary, uh, you know, the towns, Oklahoma City, for example, fought it um, and it went up and down two or three levels. And by the time uh, the, the 10th Circuit ultimately ruled on it, there was about, you know, almost a million, I believe it was almost a million dollars in attorney's fees that had been generated. So the real exposure to communities that have done this is, you know, if they do want to fight them, if they, in the end, they lose the attorney's fees for the persons who, who brought the claim uh, would, would recover. 
uh, it's not usually a matter of, of direct damages to the person claiming that their, their First Amendment rights have been violated. So um, in the event that you did adopt it and it was determined through the Connecticut State Court um, or direct challenge to you, you always could you know, go back and, and, uh, and, and lift it if you wanted it. But uh, there is legitimate First Amendment you know, grounds to, when I say legitimate, I can't tell you what would happen if this one was challenged. But there have been cases in which First Amendment challenges have been made for this kind of ordinance. I can't speak to whether I've heard rumors about some other towns looking at it. The towns that that I'm directly involved with and and in my municipal group, I haven't seen the same ordinance go around. But that's you know that's just one sample size. So this might be something that that's getting rolled out in a number of different communities. But I can't speak to that. Got it. Thank you. And thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Councilman Hill. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Attorney Slater, this, this is probably a question for you is um, in regards to the a fine that would be um, levied upon someone. What occurs when you, the, an individual cannot afford to pay the fine? In this case, I don't think it's it's like a you know there's certain statu certain statutory rights like if you don't pay your your uh, speeding ticket you don't get a license um, or if you don't pay your you know there, there can be consequences for not paying certain things. To be honest, I'm not certain how the state or the local government enforces someone not paying a fine. Um, so I can't, this, this kind of municipal fine, I don't, I don't have an answer for that. I can check into it, but I, you know, courts enter judgments and when you have a judgment, if you go to court and got a judgment, then you can, you could levy a bank account, for example, or you could attach wages, things of that nature. Um, obviously, I think if your folks are, are, are seeking, asking for alms, you chances are, but who knows? Chances are there's not a lot of assets there to go after. But uh, I don't have a specific answer what to do if someone has a has un, unpaid fines, uh, how you, whether or not there's an ability to, uh, to attach bank accounts or anything of that sort. I've never considered it. Before. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. I mean, I know it. You know, usually a fine is is the you know the deterrent. You know, for anyone for any type of ordinance, right? But when the you know the the stick so to speak is a fine for someone who almost by definition does not have the means to pay it i don't know if that's the if that's the right avenue um to go down here i mean it's um I, again i don't i don't i don't definitely don't have the answer to to that but i just feel as though there's, there's got to be some, some some sort of other remedy here as opposed to you know, someone who almost, like I said, by definition, does not have the means to pay it. And beyond that, there's some issues in terms of uh, the false or misleading manner. I mean, if someone, you know, technically that says I have, you know, I need money for food, but technically has five dollars on them, does that mean that they're, you know, they they, they had uh, violated that ordinance because they technically could buy food with it? Um, so there's just, I think this, I mean, I just have a lot of questions regarding, how, you know, how this in, in practice would actually work. Um, something, I, I agree, something needs to occur here in terms of, um, you know, maybe removing, uh, folks from the medians in terms of for safety, but, um, to, to, I think find individuals who, you know, may have either a substance abuse problem, mental illness. Um, I think uh, another measure is probably more appropriate. Thank you, Mayor. Councilman Biggs. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, Attorney Slater, so I have a question. When I worked in the, the court system, and, and by all means, I don't have any legal background, but Working in the court systems, um, one of the courts I worked in was a community court. And we tended to get a lot of um, 
panhandlers, per se, um, get summoned to court there, um, and they would um, have to do community service in place or, or whatnot. Um, and from my understanding, one of the local towns that does have an ordinance is West Hartford, because they were told to stop hanging out in West Hartford if they didn't want to get summoned to court. Um, so is there anything that you know, um, or even you, Chief, um, about the West Hartford ordinance that may be in fact that, I don't know, other, I don't know why other towns wouldn't be using it if it's working in West Hartford? Um, <clears throat> Councilman, I can't speak for West Hartford. I knew, I do know they have an ordinance. However, I can speak that this ordinance that's been proposed is a combination of Hartford's 25-15 and Manchester's ordinance. They, this, this ordinance is in play in Hartford and it actually carries a $9 fine to it, with it. But the end goal is not to find these individuals. The end goal is to get these individuals at services. And that's like you said, through community court. That's, that's the goal. First, identifying them. And, you know, they're out there, they're on the media, they're not doing anything. So when they become aggressive, and they're out in the roadway, they're impeding on traffic, or they're, or they're impeding our busways that we do act, or we get complaints from the community, because which we're starting to get complaints. And what can we do with that? And at that point, you know, we can identify them. And we have social services here through Erica. We can refer them instead of fine them. It's when, it's when it becomes aggressive and there are multiple offenses by the same person that we start going down this road. But we, I mean, but it's here, we don't have it. Then what can we really do as an agency? Is my question to you. But this ordinance is 25-15 um, city of Hartford. It's been in play for years and Manchester has a similar one. Like I said, I can't speak for West Hartford's, but I do know because of the blue back square scenario that they did impose one as well. And I did not research that one, but I can't free and get back to you on it. You know, it was interesting though, when the mayor and I started talking about getting an or ordinance due to more aggressiveness, I contacted the manager in West Hartford and he said they don't have an ordinance, they go by state statutes. They found, they decided that it was better to go by state statutes. So I can double check with Matt again, but that was the last I heard from him. So they're probably going with disorderly conduct or public disorder statute and where they're imposing a, a hindrance to the community. So that's probably what they're going based off of. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Attorney Slater. No, I, I, I would bet, I bet the same thing. Well, thank you all for that information. Uh, Councilman Peltier. Oh, thank you. I, I just want to say that, um, you know, I, I think it's important that we do do something. I know I've received a lot of complaints. I'm sure um, many of us have um, about the people standing in the media and they're there even when it's dark. It's um, it's really a public safety issue because those medians, particularly at the corner of Jordan Lane and Silas Dean Highway, are very narrow. And you know, one step off and you're in the roadway. And um, and it's it always concerns me. I drive there pretty much every day and um, it's it, it makes me nervous. I, I also do think that um, the aggressive panhandling is an issue in it. I don't know if, you know, people see it, but I, I think it probably disproportionately affects women and maybe the elderly. I, I have been, um, uh, approached by an aggressive panhandler and it's very disconcerting, you know, um, blocking my way won't, you know, following me. It's, it's, um, it's, you know, and you, you just, uh, it, it's, it's something that, um, if we can pass an ordinance that can do something or at least attempt to address it, I think it's worthwhile. Um, and I appreciated uh, Chief Medina's comments. I was kind of one. I, I had wanted to ask um, him about, you know, his thoughts on this particular ordinance and if that would help the department. Because, but it, you sort of answered that already. Um, but I don't know if you wanted to add to it. But um, I, I, because I think you know, it's this really like is something that we're hoping could um, empower the police department to, you know, help the town with this issue and. Um, and you know, being sympathetic to these you know people who are 
likely indigent or have mental health or substance abuse problems. We have so many services in the town. And um, I, I did like what you said about, um, you know, being able to um, approach them and let them know of these services because um, I don't think we're helping them by letting them stand outside all day with the cars zooming by, um, you know, trying to, you know, get cash from pedestrian or dri uh, drivers and, and risking their lives. Um, so I don't know if, uh, if Chief Medina, if you think that, um, that this ordinance would, would help your department and, you know, you would be able to um, address the panhandling issue if we were to pass the ordinance. I, I think it gives us more, um, more of a ground to stand on when we receive these complaints that when we interact and we can advise them of this ordinance and, and let them know we don't have to take action on the first interaction with them saying, hey, we're receiving complaints. This ordinance is in play. Understand that it carries a fine with it. But, you know, who are you? What are you? Why are you out here? Where you're from? And what services can we get for you? I mean, today I was driving through. I was on Jordan Lane. I was on Silas Dean and I was and I happened to be going north on the Silas Dean and I peered to the right over on Jordan Lane. Now there is a, uh, a um, uh, an area there for individuals waiting for the bus. I forgot the, uh, the name of the facility there, but that has now been, was as of this morning turned into a pretty much a makeshift housing area for our individuals. It had a full-size mattress, it had boxes, it had pillows, so forth. And I, when me and Lieutenant Conley were driving, and I told him, I said, let's go see what's there. I didn't know there were two individuals in there when we pulled up. And he's like, there's two people sleeping inside this enclosed area, which is meant for individuals waiting for the bus. So now you're impeding someone's right to take public transit because they don't feel safe going into the area that they're supposed to be going into. With that, we identified them. And then we offer services to them, to in which I even reached out to um, individuals at the state level saying, hey, here are names of these individuals. What can you do for them? And also deal with Erica on that ad side. So it's just that initial interaction. Because at the end of the day, quite frankly, I don't need someone freezing to death on, in Jordan Lane. I don't need my officers going and, 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 and pulling up a Mylar blanket and finding someone deceased because they froze overnight. I mean, what's the, what's the true goal here? Um, they're organized because I've watched them the last couple of months. They take shifts. They go from Jordan to the median, like you say, and they hand off the same sign. So what's our what's our what's our goal here? But I'm surprised for dare you say that you have actually dealt with someone who's been aggressive. See that this ordinance right here gives us the ability to say, hey, now you're being aggressive. What can we do for you before we have to fine you? So the fine is not this this ordinance. It gives us the ability to approach, but we don't have to take action. We have discretion. So that's just my thoughts on that, Counselor. Great, thank you. Thank you, very good points, uh, Chief. Appreciate that. Councilman Forrest. Thanks, Mayor. I'd like to build off, I got a bunch of questions here, but I wanna build right off of that previous conversation because it seems appropriate. Have you, um, there is, surmise, and I can't say it's more than that, that there is a co coordination of funds and efforts inter town related to this panhandling, that it may even be part of a larger operation, for lack of a better term. Now, I know you said there's handoff of signs and coordination of time. Have you gotten a feel that there's more than this, that this is a, a, a larger operation, which may have other tentacles and the tax code and so on and so forth? Or is that unknown at this time? There could be. I mean, I, based on what conversations I've had with my officers is that some of these panhandlers actually live on Jordan Lane and reside in a home. So that's the point here is identifying them, interacting with them, finding out where to live. The two that I, I interacted with today are both from New Britain. They actually said, our, my, our tent is in New Britain. And they took the bus here to West, uh, Wethersfield um, to go back. But there's others, a couple of that, I believe, that live on Jordan Lane. But until we can actually sit down and talk to them and, and deal with this, 
101, we're going to find out more. But I, I think there's a bigger picture because they seem organized to me when I watch them, when I go, when I drive through every day to and from work. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. And, and if there's more information that you gather, I think I'd be interested in sort of just understanding that dynamic a little bit more. Um, over to Attorney Slater, or um, I guess one question was asked, which I was curious. Uh, curious about is where did this ordinance come from? Is this something that was created, but it sounds like it's a mishmash of maybe two towns. Is that accurate? I think the chief answered that question because it was given, it was actually provided. I didn't draft it. It was provided to me. Uh, and I, you know, it had been worked up to fit into your, your, your code, uh, uh, numbering. And I, uh, reviewed it and, and made a couple of comments in term, terms of some of the you know, language that I thought could be less ambiguous. But uh, I think that perhaps the chief or the chief and the town manager did the, did, took the first cut at it. Nick, if we could uh, have those two towns that this was created of with provided, that would be helpful. Uh, just as far as a background about, I'm interested to see how it was merged and which pieces were taken from which. Uh, if that's I possible. That gets you both Manchester's and Hartford's. Um, and next is if there is a vi if it is found that there's a violation, Attorney Slater, is it my understanding that federal law allows for attorney's fees if it if that particular aspect is found? Is that what I heard from you? Yes, yes. I, I mean, if it's if it's brought appropriately and under you know, there's a statute. Uh, 42 section 1983 that brings as allows for a private cause of action to enforce constitutional rights. Um, and in this kind of case, you know, other than a, a fine, there wouldn't be a lot of exposure in terms of, you know, it, an impact on a person who, whose First Amendment rights have been violated. But if this were litigated through a, a stretch of time and you were unsuccessful, then those, those attorney's fees would, would be a responsibility uh, of the of the town or the town's insurance carrier. Um, are we covered under insurance in that situation? I haven't looked at the specific question. Often, no. I um, mean, when something is, is an, if something would be, it might be defended under a reservation of rights, but it might be considered a, a, a conscious decision. I can't, I'd have to look in, into that to answer that for sure. But sometimes actions that are intentional versus negligent are, are something that you'd be offended for, but you'd be responsible for at the end. But that's something I can check with, with your carrier on. And um, have you issued your legal opinion as to the constitutionality of this particular ordinance as it's proposed? No, I was asked to, I mean, I, first of all, I, I would I would put a caveat before an opinion. If the answer to the question is no, uh, I've been prepared to be able to comment on it and comment on some of the cases that have been decided that are related to these kinds of ordinances. So if I were to write an opinion, I'd, re, you know, I'd refer to the, the case in New Mexico that I mentioned. I'd refer to the case in uh, uh, Oklahoma City that I mentioned, the underlying you know, Supreme Court precedent that those cases built on. But as of right now, the Connecticut District Court or Connecticut uh, Supreme Court and or the Second Circuit, which is the court that governs Connecticut, hasn't weighed in on the issue. So it is possible that different circuits are going to have different views of, of this. So uh, I have not been asked to give a specific opinion. But if I did, my opinion would, would have that asterisk on it, which is we don't Really have any binding authority on it yet? All we can do is look at these other, other the way these other courts have looked at it to get a handle on how this might be looked at. And my understanding is from so so far that the other courts that have looked at it, although they're in separate circuits in a neighboring state, has been not favorable. I don't think I remember you saying, "Oh yeah, this one passed muster and was okay." Is is that accurate? The the, the, there was one, the Second Circuit up, up, upheld in terms of activity that went on in the subway mm -hmm. um, and found that that was something that, that the, the, fir the First Amendment did not protect uh, against. It was a panhandler uh, ordinance related to the subway. But these, if you're in a public medium, that's recognized as, as a public forum. 
um, which is a distinction between being on the subway. So most of the recent cases I've seen um, have have struck down these kinds of ordinances. But again, you know, in in one of one of them, it's the very traffic records that the, that the city tried to rely on as it, as evidence that this was unsafe. Apparently, one of the court said really supported the reverse conclusion that there really wasn't any uh, evidence that that kind of activity uh, was causing any you know accidents. Um, so some of it would be a matter of of what Weathersfield has experienced if this was something that ever was challenged. Understood. I've also heard that sometimes people cite or police officers will cite just sort of the when they need to, I don't know, move people out of the right of way or whatever it is, they cite to the state statute. I've heard these, there's, oh, we go to the state statutes and that's how we sort of ensure public safety in these types of situations, I guess is the proper way to say it. Are you, Mr. Slick, Ken, Ken or uh, Chief, uh, Attorney Slater, sorry. Um, no, Ken's fine. Are you um, are you aware of these state statutes that are used in these situations as well? Um, when we have a individual who steps into the roadway, it could be seen as illegal use of the roadway by a pedestrian. That's one. When they're stepping in the roadway with a sign, impeding traffic, that's one. That actually carries a, a, a heftier fine than the fifty dollars. Um, or you go with a disorderly. So those are the two. Um, those are heavier fines, state statute violations. Um, those are the two I can think off the top of my head. Attorney Slater. Um, yeah, those are two. I, I mean, the, the this ordinance would also include uh, improper touching of persons in the course of soliciting arms. I assume there's a state statute, as an assault or something of that nature that uh, would, would also be something you could look to. So some of these behaviors is overlap with something. That might be softer and touching hands and fists. Um, could we be provided with those state statutes that apply in this particular situation? Is that possible? I'll get those for you tomorrow, Councilman. I'll email them to you. Thanks. It seems when I read this, this is just sort of to the council. We talk about content neutral. It seems that I, I'm not happy with the way our town looks on the entrance ways either. And so I, I think generally we're all sort of figuring out how to handle the situation. But the way this particular one is written doesn't appear to really be content neutral and it appears to attack the meaning behind the actions and not the actions themselves, whether it's stepping out into a roadway, whether it's following someone. Um, there's even some aspect of this particular I, I would I noted to the council last uh, time we met, I, I asked uh, it to be sent over to attorney Slater, that section C1 and C6, which talk about the aggressive manner, talk about speaking um, and abusive and profane language in a clearly public forum uh, where that type of thing is, is pr fairly well protected. Um, that, uh, you know, swearing at someone and getting a fine for it is something that in and of itself could be, um, could have breached the line, I think, with uh, the protection of our particular rights. So I'm curious if there's any way, and I asked this last time, and hopefully Attorney Slater or the council can talk to the, our town attorney and see if there's other ways that attack or that, um, address the actions and not the content. So if it is stepping into the roadway along with the state statute, if it is um, following people um, along with the state statute, if it is the issuing, if we're allowed to issue permits, just like you would for street performers, um, if it is uh, littering according to the state statute, which ironically enough, I think there's a littering sign that's pretty close by, um, you know, these are sort of actions that are not are content neutral and yet still address the issue of the garbage and the trash and the stepping out in the front of roadways and the protection of public safety. Um, so I, I think there may be a, a slightly different way to address this issue um, and still fall within constitutional bounds. Generally speaking, I think that we would want a constitutional opinion as to whatever 
issue that whatever uh, one that we come up with, but this seems to skirt fairly close, if not over the line, since it doesn't appear to be contra neutral. And it also appears to go directly at the speech and not at the actions, which, um, which are the, of the public safety concern. Those are just some thoughts as we sort of move forward with this particular issue. Thanks for the time. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Yes, uh, I have one question for the chief. Uh, I had a resident contact me that uh, was approached at the Cumberland Farms uh, parking area, um, where, whereby the, the individual blocked the, the woman from getting out of her car. Um, she rolled down her window. He asked her for money. She said she wouldn't give him any money. And the individual wouldn't move. So she got, you know, she started her car up and drove away. She was uh, intimidated by the person. So the question is, if we were to have an ordinance, can the Weathersfield police go on private property to enforce anything with that? or? would a complaint need to be lodged by either the person in the car or the, you know, clerk at the store or something of that nature? Well, she would have to file a complaint, but if the, the if Cumberland Farms wanted to file a no standing complaint with us, order with us, that no trespassing order, that is a standing one, it's ongoing, then we can enforce it there as well. But they would have to make that complaint. But as for the individual person, that person could call 91 saying this person's doing A, B, C, and D, and we could go there and take appropriate action. Um, that to me, myself blocking somebody, impeding their way to get out of the car and intimidating and harassing them, um, those are charges that we could take immediate action on. So there's two things that you could have here a standing order from the business, no trespassing, no panhandling, or whatever, whatever they want. And then the second action is the individual filing the complaint themselves. Yeah, the, you know, the, the resident did say the person was polite, uh, you know, and when she told him uh, she wasn't going to give him any money, he said, God bless, and, but he still didn't move out of the way. So, you know, I kind of call that aggressive, but, but yeah, thank you for that. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Any other questions? Um, well, a lot of questions were raised tonight, and um, you know, I think we have some concerns uh, from this. Um, I do want to say, uh, to kind of uh, piggyback off of Councilman Forrest, it is, um, you know, it's a difficult situation because you want to protect the the rights that folks have. Um, you know, these these are uh, ladies and gentlemen who, for whatever reason, are um, turning to you know the public for help. Uh, they're, they're seeking it through monetary um, means, through, uh, you know, asking motorists or, um, you know, some in rare occasions they're asking for food if they could have it. Um, but uh, uh, not many people have, you know, food to be able to, to hand out the window. So, you know, it's easier just to um, open up the wallet and provide, you know, a couple dollars here and there not knowing where the money goes, what it is it's paying for. If it's uh, unfortunately in many of these situations, it's uh, a habit that they have um, that unfortunately they, they can't um, get the help that they, they so need. Um, it's not that for lack of services that are available, um, either they don't um, want it or they've uh, had it before and it's just not, it's not worked for them. Um, but it is, a, uh, on the other hand, it is a um, public safety issue. This is a um, situation, and I think I brought it up in the past, where uh, that intersection, and maybe Chief Medina can comment on this, is probably one of the most dangerous intersections in um, the Hartford region. Uh, it's a thoroughfare where thousands of cars intersect, uh, sometimes uh, early morning coming off of the highway and you have to take an immediate uh, U-turn to head back north into Hartford. 
Uh, that's the exact median where a lot of these um, folks are standing. Um, I've seen it, uh, you know, I'm fortunate to say that for five election cycles, I've signed waved on the corner of uh, Jordan and Silestein. And at certain times, I'm probably looking at every one of us who's signed waved on that intersection. It is dangerous as they cross through um, the red light, red arrow, trying to catch a quick turn to head onto the highway. Um, it's dangerous for people on the sides. It's dangerous for motorists. And I can only imagine um, being on a narrow median, the dangers that it presents for those standing there. Um, the town does offer services and, and thank you chief, because I, I did hear from Erica Textera that on many occasions, she herself or staff from uh, social services have gone with police and have talked to uh, those that are there and offered support from the town. Um, you know, we are grateful that we have a, a very giving community. We have a food bank, thanks to the efforts of many on this call that uh, have donated to the food bank. The mayor's charity ball donates to um, the town's food bank. Uh, so those that are in need of food have services available to themselves at town hall. Um, those that are in need of shelter have services that are available by town hall. And those that um, you know, need um, money to buy food, uh, again, generous donations of gift cards and monetary donations to social services to provide for these folks. Um, for, so it's not for a lack of services that um, we're looking to, uh, to do this, um, but there are concerns that, um, you know, that this is a, a community where we are starting to turn a blind eye to what is going on. And, um, just the, the comments from the chief about mattresses in bus shelters, um, garbage, litter, uh, blankets, uh, used food, uh, uneaten food being left um, on town property and on private property is starting to um, detract from the overall aesthetics that we want to portray uh, Weathersfield as a uh, clean community and a community that is um, uh, caring for their residents and caring for those that come into our town for whatever reason. Um, with that said, there are concerns that have been raised tonight. And, um, you know, I, I thank the chief for um, looking into what, both what um, Hartford has, uh, as well as Manchester, and also to look at what um, the town of West Hartford had done by incorporating town statutes, or excuse me, state statutes in their language. Um, I think there is a way that we could um, answer a lot of the concerns that were brought up tonight, as well as ensure uh, the safety of uh, those that are asking for food and, and mon money, um, but also to offer assurance to the residents that they um, can be safe when they are um, shopping at many of our locations on the Silestein Highway, uh, utilizing the ATMs that are on um, both uh, the highway and uh, the Berlin Turnpike. Um, this is more than just simply trying to push the problem aside and, and lock people up or, or make them pay $50 on the first offense, $100 on the second offense with community service. Um, you know, this was brought up the other day about community service. Uh, a lot of these folks may be able to tell their story to others um, that there is a better way to do this and um, that may be part of a community service um, penalty, if you will, would be to um, educate not only us about what the problems are, but maybe to educate uh, others that there are services that are available. Um, so I don't want folks on this Zoom or, or those that are listening in to simply think that this is a way to grab $100 or $50 out of people who, come on, I mean, they're asking for money. I, I think Council, uh, Councilor Slater said it. I mean, are, are you going to be able to uh, 
get the fine from somebody who's sitting there trying to get a dollar here and a dollar there. Um, you know, it may not be wise to, to look at this as a way to find folks, but more of a way to uh, educate them on what services are available to them from the town. Um, with that said, uh, I'd like to make a motion that we table this item for uh, discussion at our, what is it, February 20th? 22nd. February 22nd uh, meeting. Second. Second. Oh. Uh, say, Sue, Councilman Pentelo, I think he jumped in a little quick on that one. Okay. Uh, motion to table. So all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Ayes have it. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Council. Bye, Ken. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Good night. Okay. And then moving down to item, I believe, B5. This is rules and procedures. Um, there had been uh, some concern from a councilman on this. Uh, I believe there are uh, conversations ongoing between uh, folks that have concerns about the rules and procedures. Um, I think this has turned from a conversation on a workshop meeting versus a regular meeting to something that uh, some counselors on this Zoom wanted to clear up in the, uh, the advent of Zoom and virtual meetings. So we are discussing um, how best to approach that. Um, currently, I, if I'm not mistaken, our uh, town ordinance does not allow for uh, folks to call in by telephone means, um, but obviously we are allowed to be able to partake in council meetings and, and all boards and commission meetings via virtual platform um, due to at first the governor's executive order and then codified into state statute to allow us to do this. Um, in sense of conformity, we would like to conform our uh, town codes to um, allow for a um, counselor to vote by way of um, virtual means, but we do not want to hinder their ability to do so. So um, with that said, I will probably look to, I think Councillor Forrest, Councillor Lesser and Deputy Mayor have all had conversations with uh, the town manager on this and how best we can reconcile any differences on this. Um, but it is my hope that um, if we do table this tonight, that we can bring this up again at the um, February 22nd meeting uh, with consensus that um, works well for all those in virtual attendance that they can partake yet um, be privy to the information that is being shared by presenters and of course the dialogue and discussion on council items. With that said, I'd make a motion to table item B5. Mayor, you don't have to do that because oh, it's never got it's already, it's never was never, taken never, off the oh, table. If, uh, it, if it's never taken off the table, you can just leave it there. Yep. Thank you, Bonnie. Uh -huh. Speaking of rules and procedures, you've got my back on that. Thank you. So we'll continue to have that on the table um, for discussion uh, at the next meeting. Any questions or concerns about that? Comments? Yeah, I, just, I, I do think we're going to get there. And I want to just thank you for working with me. I'm, I'm the chief guy <laughs> uh, just to sort of work through some of the technicalities as we work, as we move forward. And I think we'll get to a good spot. I'm pretty sure we will. But there's just a couple more things we got to work out. Thank you, Matt. Thank you for acknowledging that. Appreciate it. Um, OK, moving on to uh, the minutes. And we did have those in the packet this time. So uh, if everybody had a chance to review them and if there's any questions, Councilman Lesser. I move acceptance of the January 18, 2022 minutes. I'll second, I'll second that. Okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 
Opposed, nay. Ayes have it. Motion carries. Um, who seconded? I did. Okay. Thank you. I was looking to see if anybody was going to second, but I'll take it on. Uh, and now, second portion of public comments. Uh, again, I remind folks that uh, uh, we are at five minutes. Uh, I will give an exception if Mr. Young is still on. Um, we do appreciate um, his comments about the last lengthy meeting. Uh, and yes, there were some dreary eyes at the end of that meeting. Uh, and then I would also like to remind folks, I think you have to hit star six before you speak. So if you want to speak, um, please hit star six and you're at five minutes. Five, six, three, 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 eight, seven. This is Judy Keene again, 126 Broad Street in Wethersfield. Um, I just want to again reiterate my earlier statements to support Hartford for a regional benefit, not just so that Hartford can benefit. It would be for Wethersfield's benefit as well. Um, a statistic came up this week at the noise abatement meeting that there were 62,836 flights this year. Ultimately, all of those go, went over Old Wethersfield. The CAA will never be able to divert these flights voluntarily. Um, Brainerd, by the way, also has a loss up to $500,000 every year, not counting contributions from the state that vary year to year. We are paying for the, these pilots for their very expensive hobby. I agree that there are some official flights that do leave from Brainerd. Those could be re, replaced at another airport. But these are very few and far between. It's mainly um, pleasure that um, Brainerd is uh, catering to. So with that, I'll close. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Dean. Uh, 8784688. Yes, uh, this is Claudio Boria, 639 Highland Street. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay, good, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I just wanted to say that uh, I've listened to the tonight's meeting, and um, what I wanted to do is uh, I wanted to thank the council. Uh, from last year, uh, a majority of the members are still there because I went over the meeting minutes of uh, the time when I spoke both times during the budget hearings. And basically, um, I'm, I've lived in Wethersfield 40 years. I have, I'm a retired nuclear physicist and I'm a math junkie. And uh, I hit it right on with inflation in my discussion with you when I had talked about the fact that you could not do increases. Um, and uh, I wanted to thank the council for, for holding steady. And I just want to state again, when we look at going into this year, that uh, as a good friend of mine says, let's not put Weathersfield on automatic pilot to oblivion like the state of Connecticut. Um, my projection is that we will have uh, more inflation, if not, uh, it'll be a devaluation of the dollar. We are uh, in a pretty bad uh, situation, I think. The Fed has really hurt the United States with its transitory inflationary, even though I had told you it wouldn't be a transitory inflation. It would be a situation where you need to really look at what you're doing. I know that we do a lot of payments because of state mandates, um, but you're not going to be able to, to sustain uh, colas that are large for municipal and state and federal workers, and you're not going to be able to sustain raises, and you're not going to be able to sustain gold-plated things for them. And it's not like I have anything against them. I'm trying to save their pensions because I know you might think that you have constitutional requirement to do it, but if people don't have the money, I'm sorry, you're just going to take a hit like Detroit. And, and that's what I foresee happening because of the um, financial mismanagement of the of the state and you know i mean it budgeted itself and it's got this great windfall from the market and you know things are going to continue going on great you know that's exactly one of the problems we have in the united states is that uh, people don't heed the warnings when told a perfect example is the guy on the titanic when he was told about the huge iceberg he just went to bed and said ha, this could never go down and you know he's not alive to think about it anymore and i just trying to 
warn the, the people that are in power of the same types of situations that could happen to us. So when you're in negotiations with your unions and doing things, uh, they have to understand that possibly they have to pay more for their pensions. They have to give more because we are basically insolvent in Connecticut when you have a $96 billion pension deficit. You're insolvent. You don't have the money. And then the other thing I'd like to comment on is the simple fact of the whole discussion you had with the, the panhandlers, so on and so forth. I, I think that you, you hit a lot of symptoms and symptoms and symptoms. But let me tell you, my view is when I see that you have a Congress that doesn't abide by the rules and they insider trade. I ran R&D. Do you know how many inside deals I could have made a ton of money inside trading, but I didn't do it because it's immoral, it's unethical. So when you have your leadership doing immoral and unethical things, what do you think? Then all of a sudden you have Nancy Pelosi trying to say, I don't understand why the people in San Francisco are just banging and stealing. Well, you're setting the tone. You're over there telling me I'm doing it for the children and you're taking uh, $500,000 in private air for two years. And you're saying, oh, I got to do something about climate change and all this and this and the other thing. And then let's go to Connecticut. You have a superior judge who hasn't shown up for work for two years and gets paid $380,000. What kind of example are you setting? Public trust is gone. A chief prosecutor who hires whoever he wants, even if they're qualified or not qualified. And then I hear one of my peers in, in Wethersfield saying he gets stuff all X'd out. Think about your own, own activity of what you're doing and the example you're setting. But no, you want to go after a panhandler and see if you can find someone who has no resources. Why don't you give them a state or municipal job and get them off the street like that and think about really doing what's right instead of what's convenient for you. That's all I have to say. Good night. Thank you, Mr. Poirier. Five, six, three, six, nine, two, three. Uh, good evening again. This is Robert Young from 20 Copper Mill Road. Um, I, I left off before on, at the first comment section at the cannibalist discussion. Uh, I think I finished that up, but I do want to backtrack on that for just a moment before I get started. Um, I, I know I mentioned that you had the police chief and you had Erica uh, in a, you know, attending that meeting last time to talk about issues, and they brought up some very good issues. But what I also wrote down at that time was, where was Mr. Brown, uh, our district health officer, who was with us tonight, who never commented on this uh, cannibalist uh, issue at all? But I think he would have been a real good one to listen to because he's very knowledgeable in, in all of that area. You might want to ask him to come back and talk to us about that if, if we ever should decide to open, have, have some shops open up in town. Uh, the next area I, I wanted to talk about was, and you just got done talking about it, was the rules and procedures, uh, the discussion on regular um, versus workshop meetings. And now tonight, looking at the agenda, this is a workshop meeting. And, uh, and there is no comment from the town council members uh, tonight on, on issues, just because this is a workshop meeting. Uh, something that was designed by, by the Forest Commission some uh, four, three, four, five years ago. Uh, I recall sitting in the meeting listening to it, and it was a disaster that they were what he was presenting. And uh, thank goodness, I thought it got shot down and the workshop thing was gone, and we were back to regular, but that wasn't the case. Uh, we continue to have a regular, and then we continue having a workshop every month. And, uh, I mean, I've known that for a while, but I didn't realize that at the back when they shot them down. But... Um, uh, this was nothing but a way of shutting down the public and stifling public comment. Um, you know. But anyway, all I want to say was uh, on that issue is that, uh, and, and you're talking about it tonight, I, I see no problem having a virtual um, uh, vote from a person, a town council member, virtually. But I really think you should go back to what the original um, Wording water for 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 regular you know when prior to 
the Forest Commission, uh, go back to those words, and I think you'd be better off. Uh, the next issue I wanted to talk about, and I don't want to talk about it, really is the bond council com uh, selection. I don't want to touch that. Uh, you also had a, a contra uh, custodial contract that you spoke about at the last meeting. And if I remember correctly, you had a big upcharge, but you went along and voted to go with another vendor at the bigger charge. I, I, I guess that's just another absorbing the cost doing business in town. Um, I think you should have searched for someone, should have searched some more for, for a vendor and, and found someone a little closer to the current rate that you've been paying instead of taking that, that big jump up. Um, I'm reading in the paper uh, about property taxes rising as home values surge. And I just don't understand the, the mentality in, in any of that. You know, if, you're, if your expenditures were the same as the year before, and, and we had this uh, rise in property ta in pri property assessments or values, our taxes should go down, our, our mill rate should go down. Um, same with the automobiles, it should go down if the values go up. And, and I just don't understand how, how the Hartford Current put out such, a, such an article because they said many Hartford owners, maybe that's just Hartford itself, would face sticker shock, uh, office, hotel value slide. Um, I just don't get it. Uh, how, how they Property values going up means your mill rate should be going down unless you're going to have a big you're increasing your expenditures and i i would hope that you're not increasing your expenditures going into this next budget season because now you got so much free money uh free money that's now devalued all of our all of our savings and, and that's exactly what happened and that's what the um what Murray um Claudio was just talking about a few minutes ago, the devaluation of the dollar. He, he's so right. And uh, uh, devaluating of our dollars is not a good thing at all. So anyway, uh, you know, there was also some other discussions in the paper. Trust in Washington in short supply. I mean, just, just go back and read that article, folks. It was in the Sunday newspaper on the front page on the bottom. And, and go in there and read that. And, 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 and you know, the present, the, the, the current administration says that we'd have to trust them on, on all decisions, you know, especially the decisions that they've made so far. And, and who would trust any of these people? There is no, there's no track record to where we should be able to even feel like we can trust them. So anyway, go back and read that article. I think you'd find something interesting that might reflect back in Weathersfield. Uh, thank you very much. Good night. Thank you, Mr. Young. Uh, I believe nobody else. I think uh, 4688 we had already. Yep, there's no one else. Okay. With that, uh, motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Okay, motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Are we going into oh, executive session first? Or? Oh, yes. Uh, thank you for um, asking that. And uh, I did, I had to jump over to last month's agenda uh, on the contract. Just wanted to get that, but before I did that, I missed this one. Um, no, we will not um, go into executive session. Uh, we did uh, an executive session prior to this meeting. Uh, I know it is on the agenda if we need to follow up with um, any of our attorneys, but um, I know the hour is getting late and uh, we will probably have some discussions with uh, uh, counselors uh, Ken Plum and um, Ken Slater on our next steps. Okay. okay, so we moved and seconded and voted on uh, adjournment. So I believe we are officially adjourned. Nice job today, Michael. Hey, everybody, thank you. Thank you. Good, night. Good night. Good night.
Bye.